Hello. Hello, hello, hello. I hope you are well. This is one grader. We go over climate-related material, especially recent news. My name is Dan. I hope you're well. We got a lot to get into, so I'm going to start. There's been extreme rain lately in the Central Plains and Midwest. The ground no longer is able to take in more water. So we're seeing a lot of these areas here in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Missouri, Illinois are having, I've never seen flooding like this before since I've been monitoring these probably the past few years. I've never seen so many gauges uh, popping their banks. All these dots here that you see, yellow, purple, they're all gauges and feet for the height of the body of water as they're assigned. You can see here, uh, one week, flooding's going, but maybe pass. if it went further back, now we can just see the downslope. Never seen so much flooding before, and also, Flooding in Michigan, in Arbor, Lansing, Battle Creek, over here, south, of, way south of St. Joseph's. Not St. Joseph's. Uh, Royal Oak between Royal Oak and Livonia, Sterling Heights. And now that the storm is heading northeast, there's a lot of flash flood tornado watches in the area in effect especially some excessive heat warnings in the northeast and the east, uh, east coast. But this storm here is still chugging along. This was the remnants of Hurricane Barrel. This is still ongoing. This storm started near Brazil in the ocean, went all the way through the Atlantic to the Gulf of Mexico, into Texas, through Texas, exited northeast of Texas, and kind of shot Michigan, like, what is it, three to five inches of rain? The storm still had a lot of rain trapped in it that it unzipped after it uh, encountered the lakes. It's, uh... Huge amount of rain that fell, and I'm surprised to see so many gauges tripped, actually. There's a... Uh, I'm sorry, I expect to see more gauges, sorry. Because uh, this rain lately has been unrelenting. The places like Dearborn Heights have uh, prone to flooding. And on the west coast of the United States, we got red flag warnings, excessive heat warnings all over the place. Small craft advisory, excessive heat warnings. So the entire West Coast is under an excessive heat warning and also a red flag. Let's take a look at today's outlook of fire weather. Just up there. Between Oregon and Washington, not Oregon, yeah, Oregon, Oregon and Washington. Not too severe, but 
this is more of the show here that we're looking at. This precipitation over Vermont could cause widespread flooding again. If this uh, storm continues to drop a deluge of rain. All right, so the first thing that we're going to talk about has to do with helicopters and extreme heat. A new danger at America's national parks. Helicopters in the heat. Extreme heat is making it harder for rescue helicopters to take off. This is from June 26, 2024. The thermostat read 121 degrees Fahrenheit when 71-year-old Steve Curry collapsed outside a restroom in Death Valley National Park last summer. Curry, who reportedly had been hiking on a nearby trail in Golden Canyon, was just trying to make it back to his car. The National Park Service and the Inyo County Sheriff's Office quickly responded to the scene. They tried to revive him with an external defibrillator, but it was not enough, and the medical helicopter that could have transported him to a hospital wasn't able to take off because of the extreme heat. It was too late. This summer, millions of visitors will descend on national parks. They might not realize that extreme heat is not only making the outdoors riskier, but also making rescuing those in danger much more difficult. Um, and due to it being so complicated, the uh, topography, getting there by vehicle, I can't imagine. Especially that right now it's over 130 degrees. So what's the temperature? where helicopters can no longer fly. Park rangers in Death Valley respond to overheated visitors multiple times a week in the summer months, and in recent years, heat has been a factor in one to three deaths there a year. High temperatures can lead to heat exhaustion and heat stroke. So uh, conditions that necessitate a search and rescue operation or an air ambulance, which can reach you more quickly than an ambulance on the ground, but temperatures above 120 degrees Fahrenheit, a common summer occurrence in Death Valley, make the air too thin to give an ambulance helicopter the lift it needs to get off the ground and safely stay there. I didn't know that. I didn't know that there was a temperature where helicopters fail. Where they just can't take off, they don't take off, there's no lift, the air is too thin. Like, we're putting boosters on a helicopter like we did in Vietnam, help accelerate the, hel the helicopter into the air, is almost 115 degrees most of the southwest. Uh, is the highest that I've seen besides Death Valley. I think that's definitely an anomaly. Without a helicopter, rescuers on the ground brave in the same blistering heat are the only option. Although park rangers want to help, park managers will not allow them to put their lives in danger for lengthy search and rescue operations and extreme heat. On foot, searches for people whose location is unknown are less likely to happen when temperatures are 120 degrees or hotter in Death Valley. Though park rangers will respond to medical emergencies that can safely get to undeveloped areas and along roads, for example, even in high temperatures. Those rescue challenges are likely to become more and more common at numerous national parks, some of the most popular Death Valley and Joshua Tree in California. Big Bend in Texas, Grand Canyon in Arizona are in desert regions where temp summer is just naturally, well, hot. Death Valley once reached an air temperature of 134 degrees, 
at the aptly named Furnace Creek in 1913. See, what we're, what we're talking about here when we're talking about this excessive heat, we're not talking about no place has ever experienced heat like this before, no city, no county. We're not talking about that. We're talking about our extremes becoming more extreme. There's no bottom to this. It pulls everything up with it. So even the lows become more extreme. We get more rain, stronger storms, and a brighter sun due to the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So even though that it's 110, 120 degrees in some places in the southwest, the actual physical heat that you could exhaust yourself with builds up. Heat builds up in the body over time and can cause a whole host of different uh, affecting factors that would aggravate the human, uh, a human being. To the point that they, I just want to get to my car. You know, to get to that point, you're, at, you're in danger. If you're feeling faint, if you're feeling anything different, and you know you're in the extreme heat, so you know the extreme heat building up in you is causing these problems. But these areas, like, I can't imagine collapsing in these areas because the rock that you would fall on would scorch you. The ground being over 150 degrees in some places. A lot of pain. But people do it. People go through it. They put themselves through this whole arduous hike to take a picture of a digital thermometer. I... It's just... It's, not, it's an extreme tourism, I guess, but it, you, you don't have a backup. You see like the sleeping uh, bear dunes or sand dunes, uh, sleeping bear sand dunes in Michigan. If you go down the side of the cliff and you're not able to get back up, they charge you the full amount for the rescue. They have the signs that read if you go down and you want to get back up, but you're not able to, it's like $3,000, $3,500 to be rescued. In this intense heat and these uh, brutal conditions, people having to hoof it the same way, all the way to the person that's suffering. And they have to get that person back to safety. The, you don't have a backup. If you're going to a place like Death Valley, it just seems that if helicopters aren't able to fly in to make the save, the rescue, people should really be heeding caution, especially whenever it's over 125 degrees. But the heat doesn't seem to be deterring visitors. In fact, record-breaking temperatures can even be a draw. In Death Valley, many visitors are eager to get a photo in front of the park's giant temperature thermometer with its eye-popping numbers in the triple digits. It's too risky right now. You see, like, when Death Valley was 130 degrees, you didn't have most of California, Arizona, and uh, Nevada sweltering. As we can see in the southwest, triple digits all over the place. Lake Havasu City, 115 degrees. These are temperatures that are mortally wounding. You're in this kind of wet temperature. We're one blackout away from a mass casualty event in the heat. Florida heating up a little bit, but it's still the Southwest over here, these extremes. Hundred and twenty two degrees. 
These are real temperatures. Real hot. Real... Real damaging to the human uh, skin, especially. This kind of heat, I, I just can't imagine. Because while it is kind of hot, it feels more tropical than anything right now where I am. It doesn't feel... Well, it feels like the humidity is up there, and so is the heat, but the heat not being up there in the 90s is a good thing. I am from the Midwest, and uh, temperature is over 100 degrees. I don't think I've seen in Michigan, like, especially like this, like you have 20 days straight of 105 degree temperatures. And it only goes to like 80, 85 degrees at night. So I, you know, I feel very sorry for the people that find themselves in these, uh, these heat conditions. Especially if there is a blackout or a brownout and air conditioning isn't a thing. What will happen? These are dire consequences to energy companies dropping the ball in some places if any place in arizona or southern california goes out mass blackout cooling centers too then where will people go to cool off if the ambient temperature is no longer enough to give relief if the if you try to use a fan to blow air on yourself it's not going to work. It's too hot. And when it hits that 120 degrees, helicopters can no longer take off. I don't know if that means a helicopter can't fly into the area and land, and that's when it like can't take off, if it came from an area that's under 100 degrees. 120 degrees. As extreme heat bakes the west, emergency helicopters struggle to fly. Delicious. Stanford, California. The call came at 2 p.m. Sunday. A driver suffered a brain injury in a traffic accident and needed to be flown to a different hospital as soon as possible. Lead helicopter pilot Douglas Evans noted the 116.6 degree temperature in Redding, California, where he would need to land. Oh, this is tarmac was probably even hotter. In 27 years of operating medical helicopters around California, Evans had never had to cancel a flight because of excessive heat until now. It was too hot to fly. Evans and other emergency responder pilots are used to factoring California's wind, smog, and fire smoke into their flight decisions, but extreme heat, like the intense wave blanketing the West right now, is affecting the way rescue helicopters can carry out their missions. High temperatures, which are increasing due to human-caused climate change, are altering operations in broad swaths of the state. Reach Air Medical Services, which operates 30 helicopter bases across California, declined. At least two rescue calls over the weekend because of excessive heat, said Vicky Spedaki, the company's chief operating officer. This is pretty rare. There can be pockets, but this was way more wide, widespread. 
Companies sometimes reroute in hot weather to land at an airport where there are fewer obstacles instead of on the scene. Landing in a confined area can require more engine power, which is harder in high temperatures who was a pilot for 40 years. The heat is hampering efforts to transport patients and conduct rescues in the, nation, in the region's national parks, places that can rely on choppers amid the vast wilderness. When hikers get lost or become stranded on remote trails, helicopters are sometimes sent to locate and pull them out. National parks, including Joshua Tree and Death Valley, warn visitors that a helicopter may not be able to reach ambitious hikers in the heat, park ranger said. When temperatures pass 122 degrees, which has already happened in, this part, in parts of California, including Death Valley, medical helicopters often cannot fly. This is um, getting worse. It's not just that people are flocking to extreme tourism, but it's the fact that if something were to happen to these people during this hike, especially succumbing to heat, a helicopter wouldn't be able to get out there and rescue them. 122 degrees, 120 degrees, 122 degrees, the two temperatures that I've read where helicopters can no longer fly. Does that mean they just fl fall out of the sky? So if one helicopter is coming from a hospital where it's 105 degrees te temperature, it can still take off and lift and travel. But what happens when it gets to that region where it's over 120 degrees Fahrenheit? Does the helicopter experience turbulence? Does it just fall out of the sky? Or is it just whenever it lands, it can't take back off? These are really extremes that we're hearing right now. Yeah, so hiking in extreme heat very dangerous. Heat creeps up on you. It is not normal. You might not think that you're feeling a heat stroke. You're not having symptoms. You're sweating or you're not sweating. Not sweating heat stroke. Sweating heat stress. And it's when the ambient air temperature no longer gives you that cooling. A few weeks ago, Marina said the park called in the chopper for a hiker who had extreme exhaustion off trail in the middle of the afternoon. The train wasn't flat or easy to get to by vehicle, and it was cool enough for the person to be rescued by helicopter. But when it's hotter, such rescues might not be possible. This is uh, pretty crazy to me. I just think of helicopters like state parks. They're pretty much uh, a staple in rescuing people in such long distances because to have the rescuers face the same arduous track with more equipment on them than the people they're trying to rescue, 
it, it just seems insane. Like, you can't let people risk it. Intense heat creates a lot more stress on the helicopters. That could affect our operations. When it is hot out, the air is thin, meaning choppers' blades have less air to grab onto. That affects their ability to lift off and navigate. The system on board can overheat and stop working. Pilots have to make adjustments to weight, equipment, and route planning, or they may have to decline to go altogether. This is horrible. It's uh, a staple. So, whenever they're uh, flying and navigating, they have to make decisions because the helicopter needs less weight to take off, if it's possible to even take off in this, this uh, temperature in the first place. When the air is too thin, the chopper blades aren't just grabbing any air. Pretty incredible. I don't know if because um, during Vietnam, we, uh, the United States had boosters, rocket boosters on their helicopters. I'm not sure if that was the reason because it was too hot to take off and the air was too thin or if they just needed to take off now, like right now, like, boof, right in the air. Now, that's the only place I've ever seen like boosters on a helicopter. When a call comes in, control radios the pilot and asks if the weather is good to fly. We won't tell the pilot the details of the case to avoid any biases. Biases. So the pilot doesn't even know yet. That's probably a headache in its own that they ha they can't know the details of the case yet before taking on the call. That's unreal. Uh, you, you, you have to be prepared for anything. Literally anything. Because anything could happen. If the flight is approved, the nurses and pilot on dip duty zip up their thick, fire-resistant fly suits and board the chopper. So how hot the engines can get. The flight was just five minutes long, but upon landing, the staff peeled off the layers and reached for chilled water bottles and frozen treats they keep on base. Trips for them can be as long as two hours. You basically just sit there and roast. It's, uh... So they have these giant suits to help them with the heat because it's so extreme that even whenever they're able to uh, fly, it's just horribly dis uh, discomforting. And having the people that you're trying to rescue already succumbing to heat stroke, every minute counts. So putting on the gear, taking the gear with you, the equipment, these are some really insane, dangerous calls. You have to go to where an area isn't going to be exactly flat. Even under the 120 degree limit, high temperatures affect the team's operations. 
above 104, we can only operate on the ground for 15 minutes. Sometimes Evans will fly to higher altitudes to cool down the helicopter, but often ascending means less oxygen for a patient already in distress. That's pretty amazing that they're able, able to do that. But how high they have to go to be able to get that kind of cooling. Evans knew early life he wanted to be a pilot. He started off flying small planes, but says he realized it was more fun being able to move sideways and backwards to hover and fly among the trees. That he flies to save lives only makes the job more rewarding. His favorite missions are the ones that involve obstacles, landing on bridges or beaches, navigating the chopper in the middle of a city. But heat was an obstacle he didn't see coming. One he anticipates will make his job harder if he has to turn down more flights. It is the most difficult part of the job, he said, saying no. Very disastrous this could become as more and more areas see ambient temperatures of over 110 degrees you get burned really burned 120 degrees these temperatures are unmanageable when sweat no longer gives you relief. Heat stroke can build up, creep up, but helicopters can succumb to heat stroke as well as their engines overheat. You have to fly them pretty high up there to be able to get that uh, cooling in the atmosphere. This is uh, tragic. Visitor dies traveling through Death Valley on motorcycle. A park visitor. A park visitor died in Death Valley National Park on July 6 from heat exposure near Badwater Basin. Another visitor was treated for a severe heat illness and transported to advanced medical care in Las Vegas. Four others were treated on site and released. All six motorcyclists were members of the same party. Due to the high temperatures, emergency medical flight helicopters were unable to respond as they cannot generally fly safely over 120 degrees. We've just been talking about this. We've just been talking about how it's dangerous. The helicopters can't fly in extreme heat. And the first death that I pull up related to Death Valley in extreme heat could not be rescued by a helicopter due to the extreme heat causing the helicopter, the air to be too thin for the blades to be able to grab onto. This is tragic. High heat like this can pose real threats to your health, said Superintendent Mike Reynolds. While this is a very exciting time to experience potential world record setting temperatures in Death Valley, we encourage visitors to choose their activities carefully, avoiding prolonged periods of time outside of an air conditioned vehicle or building when temperatures are this high. They were treated on site. Real tragic. The whole group almost succumbed to heat stroke. Due to the high temperatures, emergency medical flight helicopters were unable to respond. 
This is becoming a problem immediately. Temperatures are all over the place. But if a helicopter can't pass, navigate through the high temperatures, they can't even take off. People are going to suffer. And like this person here, this visitor, died due to a helicopter not able to take off. That has to have an effect on the pilot that has to turn down the call because of the temperatures. This from the Guardian. Welcome to the sixth mass extinction. Florida, tree cactus becomes the first local species killed off by sea level rise. Key Largo tree cactus no longer growing naturally in U.S. thanks to saltwater inundation and soil depletion. Scientists in Florida have recorded what they say is the first local extinction of a species caused by sea level rise. The climate emergency was killed off the Key Largo tree cactus growing naturally in the U.S. through saltwater inundation and soil depletion from hurricanes, according to researchers from the Florida Museum of Natural History and Miami's Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden. The species, which is now found only on a handful of remote Caribbean islands, northern Cuba, and areas of the Bahamas, was already down to only a single population of six stems in the Florida Keys. Those were removed to a greenhouse in 2021 to ensure the species' survival, and frequent searches since have revealed no naturally growing Key Largo cactuses. There is also little prospect of it reestablishing itself. Despite tentative plans with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection for a small scale replanting project, about 90% of the low lying Florida Keys island chain is at five feet of elevation or less, with NASA predicting future ocean rise of up to seven feet by 2100. The year 2100. Unfortunately, the Key Largo tree cactus may be a bellwether for how other low lying coastal plants will respond to climate change, said Fairchild botanist Jennifer Posley, lead author of a study published Tuesday in the Journal of Botanical Research Institute of Texas that chronicled the species' decline. The scientists say they noticed the population of Pilosaurus milsoggi, probably butchered that, in the Keys was already ailing in 1992 when it was first discovered to be a separate species to the key tree cactus, which is similar in appearance and present elsewhere, present elsewhere in the Keys, although also in declining numbers. A storm surge event in the Lower Keys in 2005 established a link between water salinity and mortality of cactuses. Subsequent surges from hurricanes and exceptionally high tides eroded the layers of soil and organic matter close to shore where the Key Largo cactuses were growing. Additionally, researchers found mammals deprived of fresh drinking water elsewhere were eating the moisture retaining plants and causing even more harm. In 2011, we started seeing salt water flooding from king tides in the area. We had never seen cactus herbivory like this anywhere in the lower keys where flooding has tended to be less extensive.
he said salt tolerant plants that had previously restricted to brackish soils beneath the mangroves slowly began creeping up the outcrop an indication that salt levels were increasing those conditions alone he said would have eventually killed the species and within a few years almost 50 percent of the key Largo cactus population had been lost then in 2017 category 4 hurricane irma swept over south florida destroying even more cactuses and leaving the area flooded for weeks followed by successive king tides in 2019 and a decision two years after to evacuate the small number of stems that still survived authors of the study which included input from the dep and researchers from the university of florida say the demise of the key largo tree cactus and the necessity of its removal has given them a better idea of what to expect as more species are affected by the climate crisis lang however said countering the damage to environments and preserving them would not be easy understanding and predicting the fate of rare organisms and their habitats in the face of climate change will likely be complicated by similar ecological interactions and require a multidisciplinary approach to cons conservation he said we have the victim of sea level rise inundation salt water inundation the florida tree cactus This is uh, another image of the Key Largo tree cactus, which is now extinct, naturally occurring. So in Florida, it lived in a unique and rare habitat called a coastal rock barren, a limestone outcropping surrounded by mangroves that is disappearing as sea level rise in response to melting polar ice sheets and mountain glaciers. The die-off accelerated in 2017 after a five-foot storm surge of salt water from Hurricane Irma struck the region, and by 2019, the colony collapsed, the researchers report. This is from the Guardian. Las Vegas on track to set record for most consecutive days over 115 degrees Fahrenheit. The city will probably hit the fifth straight day above 115 degrees Fahrenheit on Wednesday and record could be extended through Friday. In the image here, people use umbrellas to block the sun while waiting to take a photo at the Welcome to Las Vegas sign on July 8, 2024. Las Vegas is on track to set a record for the most consecutive days over 115 degrees Fahrenheit or 46 degrees Celsius amid a lingering hot spell that will continue scorching much of the U.S. into the weekend. 
Forecasters say the desert city will probably hit a record fifth straight day above 115 degrees Fahrenheit on Wednesday. Even by desert standards, the prolonged baking the city is experiencing is nearly unprecedented. This is the most extreme heat wave in the history of record keeping in Las Vegas since 1937, said meteorologist John Adair, a veteran of three decades at the National Weather Service office in Southern Nevada. Tuesday's high temperature ties the mark of four straight days above 115 degrees Fahrenheit set in July 2005, and Adair says the record could be extended through Friday. The extended heat wave comes with serious dangers, health officials have emphasized. Even people of average age who are seemingly healthy can suffer heat illness when it's so hot it's hard for your body to cool down. While hotels and casinos keep visitors cool with giant AC units, the scorching heat presented acute danger for homeless residents and others without access to safe environments. Officials have set up emergency cooling centers at community centers across southern Nevada. Firefighters in Henderson, Nevada last week became the first in the region to deploy what city spokesperson Madeline Skeynes called polar pods. The intense heat wave hitting Las Vegas has been searing much of the U.S. West in recent days with several places setting heat records and reporting fatalities. In Oregon, the city of Portland saw record daily temperatures on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and Salem set a new record hitting 103 degrees Fahrenheit on Sunday. In California, the heat was blamed for a motorcyclist death in the Death Valley National Park. Death Valley is considered one of the most extreme environments in the world. The hottest temperature ever officially recorded on Earth was 134 degrees Fahrenheit in July 1915 in Death Valley. Though some experts dispute that measurement and say the real record was 130 degrees Fahrenheit recorded there in July 2021. On Tuesday, Tourist visiting the park queued for photos in front of a giant thermometer that was reading 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Phoenix, Arizona, which has averaged the hottest temperature ever for the first eight days of July and records dating to 1885, tied the daily record on Tuesday of 116 degrees Fahrenheit set in 1958. Triple digit temperatures were also recorded in Idaho. Reno, Nevada broke its daily record with 104 degrees Fahrenheit on Tuesday and was suffering through the longest streak ever of days hitting 105 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. Before this week, the city, at an elevation of 4,500 feet, had never been that hot for more than two consecutive days of records dating to 1888. The U.S. heat wave comes as the global temperature in June set a record for the 13th straight month and marked the 12th straight month that the world was 1.5 degrees Celsius warmer than the pre-industrial times, the European Climate Service Copernicus said. Most of this heat, trapped by the human-caused climate crisis, is from long-term warming from greenhouse gases emitted by the Burning of coal, oil, and natural gas, scientists say.
Apologies, I had to step away for just a moment. <clears throat> Extreme heat is exacerbating the threat of wildfires across the U.S. West, where a long-standing drought has dried out vegetation that fuels the blazes. A new fire in Oregon, dubbed the Larch Creek Fire, quickly grew to more than 5 square miles or 12 square kilometers on Tuesday evening as flames tore through grasslands in Wasco County. Evacuations were ordered for remote homes about 15 miles south of the dailies. In California, firefighters were battling at least 18 wildfires Tuesday, including a 42 square mile blaze that prompted evacuation orders for about 200 residences in the mountains of the Santa Barbara County. That blaze, called the Lake Fire, was only 16% contained, and forecasters warned of a volatile combination of high heat, low humidity, and northwest winds developing late in the day. And northeast of Los Angeles, the two square kilometer mile I'm sorry, the two square mile Vista fire chewed through trees in the San Bernardino National Forest and sent up a huge plume of smoke visible across the region. The National Weather Service says extending the excessive heat warnings across most of the southwest U.S. through Saturday morning. Not over yet, the service in Reno said. You see these temperatures all over the place? 118 degrees, 116 degrees. Uh, Las Vegas is seeing temperatures of over 115 degrees. Like, this is ridiculous. It is sweltering. I don't even know what word to use to describe what people might be experiencing. And temperatures above 115 degrees. Fahrenheit. Intense temperatures all across the board. Arizona, Utah, Nevada, Nevada, California. And we're going to keep getting hotter. This is from the conservation. Conversation. Extreme heat waves broiling the U.S. in 2024 aren't normal. How climate change is heating up weather around the world. Less than a month into summer 2024, the vast majority of the U.S. population has already experienced an extreme heat wave. Millions of people were under heat warnings across the western U.S. in early July or sweating through humid heat in the east.
Death Valley hit a dangerous 129 degrees Fahrenheit on July 7th, a day after a motorcyclist died from heat exposure there. Las Vegas broke its all-time heat record at 120 degrees Fahrenheit or 48.9 Celsius. In California, days of over 100 degree heat in large parts of the state dried out the landscape, fueling wildfires. Oregon reported several suspected heat deaths. Extreme heat like this has been hitting countries across the planet in 2024. Is uh, talking about the Grand Mosque in Mecca on June 17th. People died. Over 1,000 people on the Hajj, a Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca. Hospitals in Karachi, Pakistan, were overwhelmed amid weeks of high heat, frequent power outages, and water shortages in some areas. Neighboring India faced temperatures around 100 degrees Fahrenheit for several days in April and May that affected millions of people, many of them without air conditioning. In Greece, where temperatures were over 100 degrees Fahrenheit for days in June, Several tourists died or were feared dead after going hiking in dangerous heat and humidity. Japan issued heat stroke alerts in Tokyo and more than half of its prefectures as temperatures rose to record highs in early July. The climate connection. This isn't just summer. Although heat waves are a natural part of the climate, the severity and extent of the heat waves so far in 2024 are not just summer. A scientific assessment of the fierce heat wave in the eastern United States in June 2024 estimates that heat so severe and long-lasting was two to four times more likely to occur today because of human-caused climate change than it would have been without it. This conclusion is consistent with the rapid increase over the past several decades in the number of United States heat waves and their occurrence outside the peak of the summer. While a temperature difference of a degree or two when you walk into a different room might not even be noticeable, even fractions of a degree make a large difference in the global climate. At the peak of the last ice age, some 20,000 years ago, when the northeast United States was under thousands of feet of ice, the globally average temperature was only about 11 degrees Fahrenheit, cooler than now. So it is not surprising that 2.2 degrees Fahrenheit of warming so far is already rapidly changing the climate. If you thought this was hot, while the summer is likely to be one of the hottest on record, it is important to realize that it may also be one of the coldest summers of the future. For populations that are especially vulnerable to heat, including young children, older adults, and outdoor workers, the risks are even higher. People in lower income neighborhoods where air conditioning may be unaffordable and renters who often don't have the same protections for cooling as heating will face increasingly dangerous conditions. Extreme heat can also affect economies. It can buckle railroad tracks and cause wires to sag, leading to transit delays and disruptions. It can also overload electric systems with high demand and lead to blackouts just when people have the greatest need for cooling.
The good news? There are solutions. Yes, the future in a warming world is daunting. However, while countries aren't on pace to meet their Paris Agreement goals, they have made progress. In the United States, the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act has potential to reduce U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by nearly half by 2035. There is much that humanity can do to limit future warming if countries, companies, and people everywhere act with urgency. Rapidly reducing fossil fuel emissions could help avoid a warmer future with even worse heat waves and droughts while also providing other benefits including improving public health, creating jobs, and reducing risks to ecosystems. Taking a train during a heat wave, watch out for sun kinks. As tracks heat up, they expand and buckle. That's forcing rail operators to adapt as the climate warms. One of the iconic sensory experiences of riding a train is actually the sound of ingenuity. As steel railroad tracks heat up, they grow. 1,800 feet of rail expands by more than an inch for every 10 degrees Fahrenheit of temperature increase. So rails used to be laid down in sections, each between 30 and 60 feet long with small gaps. The very specific railway noise that you hear, ch-chant, 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 is because there is a gap between the rails and this gap is meant for such expansion. Still, in a severe heat wave, the rail can swell until the underlying ties can no longer contain it. Then, the rail gets visibly wavy, morphing into what's known as a sun kink. That's a serious hazard for trains, which can derail on misaligned tracks. In extreme cases, the track can violently buckle going from a straight shot to grotesque curves almost instantly. So if it's excessively hot out, rail services will slow their trains as a precaution, which provides less of the mechanical energy that can lead to buckling. Amtrak, for instance, restricts speeds to 80 miles per hour if the rail temperature hits 140 degrees. That was partly the reason behind Amtrak delays in the Northeast Corridor, which runs between Washington, D.C. and Boston during a brutal heat wave last month. As extreme heat waves get worse, more tracks will turn into sun kinks, disrupting commuter rail service that reduces carbon emissions and slows that warming. In 2019, a study estimated that the U.S. rail network could see additional delay costs totaling between 25 billion and 45 billion USD by the year 2100 in a scenario that assumed greenhouse gas emissions decline in the next 20 years. Compared to a tree falling on top of a track and blocking traffic or a switch breaking, heat is a much larger, harder problem for rail operators to deal with. Heat waves tend to be regional, so the impacts can be huge said Jacob Hellman, one of the authors of that 2019 study and a senior climate consultant at Resilient Analytics, 
which provides infrastructure vulnerability assessments. It can impact the entire Northeast corridor over the course of five days. As climate change drives hotter and longer heat waves, companies are reevaluating their operations and adapting new technologies. Railroads already use remote sensors to determine the temperatures of the rails, but are still getting more sophisticated as heat waves intensify. They're using computer modeling, for example, to figure out how to make tracks more resistant to buckling, among many other steps. The industry is implementing new ways to use advanced sensors, satellite imaging, and AI to constantly monitor track health and respond to any potential hazards. That's Scott Cummings, Assistant Vice President of Research and Innovation at MXV Rail, a subsidiary of the Association of American Railroads. While those gaps in the rail reduce the problem of buckling, each wheel of a train rolling over each gap results in wear and tear, both on the rail and the cars. So, chunk, chunk. While those gaps in the rail reduce the problem of buckling, each wheel of a train rolling over each gap results in wear and tear both on the rail and the cars. In response, railroads have for decades been deploying, deploying continuous welded rail, or CWR, segments of track stretching a quarter mile or more. CWR. CWR is held firmly in place by concrete ties. The strips under the rails used to be made of wood, themselves held in place with ballast stones poured in between them. It's all just so much more rigid. You've got so much more mass there to keep everything in place. Railroads even adapt tracks to a specific climate by installing continuous welded rail on a day with the right conditions Crews prepare it for the local high and low temperatures. Tracks are laid and secured at the neutral temperature, which is the average temperature of the rails. This helps ensure that the rail remains stable throughout temperature fluctuations. As regional temperatures rise, railroads might opt to lay down track on hotter days, thus preparing the rail for increasingly extreme heat. Though when the rails get cold in winter, they contract, which can cause cracking. Another intervention is painting the rails white, which reflects a good amount of the sun's energy off the steel. It sounds crazy, Pike said, but it works. It's labor intensive. You have to keep reapplying because of the wear and tear on the paint and the fact that it dirties over time. But track mounted machines can do the work quickly. A new technology known as distributed acoustic sensing uses fiber optic cables running along railways to listen for defects. Disturbances on the track jostle the optics, changing how light travels through them. As analyzed by a special device to determine whether a rock pole has crashed on into the tracks or if a crack had formed in the rails, as each kind of disturbance has its own unique signal. As the tracks heat up, heats up and expands, the fiber optics already hear thermal pops. Theoretically, Pike said, Sensonics technology could detect the unique ground vibrations associated with buckling. They just need data. Perhaps they can manually heat up a test track to induce a sun kink to train the algorithm on what to listen for. 
we already produced some rockfall landslide sensors and they're looking for ground vibrations pike said so i would imagine i can't promise but i would imagine we could tweak those to be able to detect it if railroads can get better data on their vulnerability to buckling like specific track temperatures over wide areas instead of relying on interfin inter inferences from local air temperatures they could more accurately determine how much to slow trains as a precaution that would avoid delays keep commuters from returning to their cars save railroads money and generally make trains safer you can make more informed decisions about speed orders said hellman from resilient analytics maybe it doesn't need to be 40 miles per hour maybe it only needs to be 10. maybe you don't need it at all This is from The Guardian. Devastation as world's biggest wetland burns. Those cannot run, don't stand a chance. The uh, Pantanal, the world's largest wetland and one of the most biodiverse places on the earth, is on fire. Huge stretches of land resemble the aftermath of a battle, with thick green shrubbery now a carpet of white ash and chunks of debris falling from the sky. More than 760,000 hectares, or 1.8 million acres, have already burned across the Brazilian Pantanal in 2024, as fires surged to the highest level since 2020, the worst year on record. From January to July, blazes increased by 1,500% compared with the same period last year, according to the country's Institute for Space Research. <laughs> the impacts are devastating. Animals are dying. Wildfires are vanishing huge areas, said Gustavo Figueroa, a biologist at SOS Pantano a non-governmental organization. We expect it is only going to get worse. Stretching across Brazil, Bolivia, and Paraguay, the Pantanal covers 16.9 million hectares, or 42 million acres, and harbors rich biodiversity. It is one of the world's main refuges for jaguars and ho houses a host of vulnerable and endangered species including giant river otters, giant armadillos, and hyacinth macaws. Its ecosystem is also unique. Every year, its flood pulse sees its swell with water during the rainy season and empty throughout the dry months. But the climate crisis, droughts, and weak rains have distributed, I'm sorry, disrupted this seasonal pattern, turning the land into a tinderbox.
ash everywhere. Tree is still on fire. Nothing, nothing fries in the smoke. The remains of a snake. Reptiles, snake, frogs, all the animals that cannot run, they do not stand a chance. The firestorm approaching. There's not much that can get out of the way. Hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit, firestorm can find itself in. Up with smoke, intense heat, fire, flame. What cannot run, not escape, it comes to the smoke, it comes to the flames. This is a global tragedy. We have one wetland in South Sudan that's burning. One of the top five largest wetlands on the planet. And also the Pantanal wetland is burning. Our wetlands are putting out carbon in great quantities into the atmosphere. We're seeing more and more severe fires. Especially in wetlands, in South Sudan, and Brazil. Humans start the vast majority of wildfires. Ranchers use fires to clear land for their cattle, as they have for centuries. But those that were once contained by the wetlands abundant water now rage out of control. More than 90% of the Pantanal is privately owned, of which 80% is used for cattle ranching. Almost 95% of outbreaks in the first half of 2024 started in private areas, according to the National Institute for Space Research. 90% of it is privately owned. 80% of it is used for cattle ranching. Clearing 
white land for cheap beef. The wetlands have also lost 68% of their water area since 1985 and suffered a lack of rainfall over the past six months. The Pantanal is getting drier and drier. It used to flood for six months, but now it floods only two or three months. Fierce winds rip across the landscape at about 40 kilometers an hour, fueling the flames. The layers of dense, built-up material can burn underground for weeks. So it's these um, zombie fires. You think you put them out, you think you're down, but there is a fire burning deeper in the ground that you can't see. There's no smoke, and it's just smoldering. Along with the important role they play for biodiversity, wetlands are also of global importance for the climate, storing 30, 20-30% of the terrestrial carbon despite covering only 5% 5 to 8% of the land surface. The Brazilian Air Force, oh wait, the government of Mato Grosso do Sul declared an emergency situation on June 24th, while the federal government has recently expanded its wildfires task force. The Brazilian Air Force dropped, airdropped 48,000 liters of water onto the burning land last weekend. zombie fires still the fires burn on underneath the nest of a jabu jabiru stork the tallest flying bird found in south and central america in the symbol of the pantano the fire fire cabo sena 30 works to douse the flames we extinguish the fire and then after 24 hours it starts again he says The fire was far away when we went to sleep, but then the wind became strong and carried it to us. It happened fast. I was desperate. We were covered in ash. My grandson was crying and my mother praying. We fell to our knees and held each other. Oliveira worries about what their future holds. Every year is worse, and I am afraid. The animals and plants in the land are dying, from the bees to the jaguars. We need even the smallest animals to be able to survive. The fires are destroying the beauty of the Pantanal. It is... Alarming. The largest wetland in the world is burning. As you can see in this image, only red photons are able to get through this cloud, this smoke, this dense smoke. Because red photons are longer than blue photons. They're able to get through that's why you're only seeing the red light through the smoke. That's why it's a very strange sun to see.
is the world's biggest wetland burning. Chowchilla, women's prison inmate, dies during heat waves. This is uh, California. An inmate death in a California's women's prison during a heat wave underscores concern over inadequate cooling measures and the potential violation of inmates' rights amid extreme heat conditions. Chowchilla women's prison inmate dies during heat wave by Anthony Haddad. An inmate at the Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla died Saturday mid. That sounds like AI. I don't like that. That's not that's by Trinity Audio. Yeah, it's definitely AI. You gotta be careful with that. I don't want AI to be reading it all. Inmate at the, Cal the Central California's women facility in Chochilla died Saturday amidst the high heat, raising concerns about extreme heat in prisons, the Sacramento Bee is reporting. Adrini Bowyer's family says she died from heat stroke, but prison officials suggested pre-existing health conditions were a factor. The coroner's office is determining the official cause of death. Bulware's daughter, Michaela Nelson, said her mother had long complained about the summer heat, knowing the prison's lack of air conditioning. Something could have been done to prevent it, and she was so close to coming home, it's like a slap in the face, Nelson said. Bulware was set to be released in February 2025. Issues with heat response extend beyond Chochilla. Travis Martin, an inmate at Pleasant Valley State Prison, reported inadequate cooling measures and high temperatures were locked inside of a cell that's greater than 90 degrees and is dangerous, he said. California Prison <laughs> spokesperson Mary Zajimez said housing units provide cooling relief, often through evaporative coolers and fans. However, advocates argue these measures are not consistently applied. A 2024 study found California ranks third in exposing inmates to hazardous heat days behind Texas and Florida. No surprise there. A heat advisory of the CDCR's website warns of extreme heat and advises staying cool and hydrated. Inmates at Chochilla, like Transita Ponce, report extreme heat conditions and lack of response from officials. Recent indoor heat regulations in California exempt prisons, citing financial burdens. This exemption allows continued extreme heat exposure for inmates. Carter White, a UC Davies, Davies law professor, argued that such conditions could violate the Eighth Amendment. Advocates call for immediate action to cool facilities and prevent further heat-related illnesses or deaths. This is from the Washington Post. What to know about the plague after a suspected human case in Colorado. 
A possible case is being investigated in Colorado. Bubonic plague is the most common form of the bacterial infection, which can be spread by fleas on rodents. A rare case of plague is being investigated in Pueblo County by the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment after preliminary test results, it said in a statement. Plague is a bacterial infection that was historically very deadly but now is better treated. While not totally eradicated, human human transmission of bubonic plague is rare. The WHO. An average of seven human plague cases are reported each year in the United States. Excuse me. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, with most cases occurring in the West, especially in northern New Mexico and in Arizona. In February, a case of human plague was confirmed in rural Oregon. The unnamed person there was thought to have been infected by a pet cat, which had symptoms, health officials said. The case was identified and treated early, posing little risk to the community. What is the plague and how does it spread? The plague is caused by a zoonotic bacteria known scientifically as Yersinia pestis. It is transmitted by fleas and cycles naturally among wild rodents. Bubonic plague, the most common form, is characterized by painful swollen lymph nodes or buboes. The bacteria multiply in a lymph node close to where they enter the human body following a flea bite and can spread to the bloodstream if left untreated. Other symptoms can include a sudden fever and chills, severe headaches, muscle aches, nausea, vomiting, and according to the Colorado Health Department. Symptoms generally develop after an incubation period of one to seven days, WHO says. Plague occurs naturally and can affect humans and their pets. People can get plague from the bites of infected fleas, by touching infected animals, or by inhaling droplets from the cough of an infected person or animal. We advise all individuals to protect themselves and their pets from plague, the Colorado Health Department said in a statement. What's the treatment for plague? Plague can be treated successfully with antibiotics, but an infected person must be treated promptly to avoid serious complications or death, said Alicia Solis, program manager at the Pueblo Public Health Department. Plague can be a severe disease in humans and fatal if untreated. If plague Patients are not given specific antibiotic therapy. All forms of plague can progress rapidly to death, according to the CDC. Usually, patients will have blood and other samples, such as sputum or pus, taken from a bubo. If the plague is identified, then antibiotics are administered as the usual treatment, and the patient may be medically isolated. Early diagnosis and early treatment can save lives, according to the WHO. There is no commonly available vaccine for the plague. Improved sanitation and better living conditions and health care have helped to temper the disease. The last urban outbreak of rat-associated plague in the United States occurred in Los Angeles in 1924 to 1925, the CDC said. Worldwide, since the 1990s, plague cases have occurred mostly in Africa, according to the WHO. The three most endemic countries are in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Madagascar, and Peru, it says. Tips to avoid the plague. According to the Pueblo County Public Health Department, there are several ways to prevent contracting or spreading plague, including 
Eliminate places that rodents can hide and breed around your home, garage, shed, or recreation area. Avoid contact with dead animals. Treat dogs and cats for fleas regularly. Flea, collaries, flea collars have not been proven effective. Do not allow pets to hunt or roam in areas with rodents, such as prairie dog colonies. Keep pet food in rodent-proof containers. If you develop symptoms of plague, see a health care provider immediately. This is from Food Safety News. Don't consume raw milk. Consuming raw milk has the side effect of giving the quaffer a maximum viral load of H5N1. This is different though here. Listeria salmonella, like more than 165 infected with salmonella in raw milk outbreak. More than 165 ch people, mostly children. What are you feeding children raw milk? Don't, that's so dangerous, especially right now. Have been sickened so far by raw milk products from Raw Farm LLC. In reports obtained by Food Safety News from the California Division of Communicable Disease Control and the California Department of Health, the salmonella outbreak has sickened 165 people across four states. Previously, the Department of Health was reporting a dozen sick. The most recent of the reports is from February this year. The most recent illness was recorded this past month. Over the past over the last 30 plus years of practice, I have been a vocal advocate for robust public health involvement in disease, especially foodborne illness prevention. It is beyond me to comprehend why public health would remain mute in the face of at least 165 sick, 20 hits hospitalized, and 40% of the ill five years or younger, especially raw milk, a risky elixir. The more I think about this, the harder it is to figure out why public health would sit on the scientific fact that a food producer of a no high risk food is sickening hundreds. This includes overwhelming Epidemiological. Epidemiological events of the same WGS pattern in both humans and in milk. Setting aside the food freedom argument for a moment that people should be able to eat or drink what they want and feed their kids the same. What about simply informing the public of the facts and letting the public decide for themselves? The number of patients in the outbreak is likely much larger, much higher than the numbers reported by the Division of Communicable Disease Control because of under-reporting. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says that for every confirmed patient in a salmonella outbreak, there are 29 unreported patients. Raw Farm LLC, formerly doing business as Organic Pastures, is implicated in the outbreak. Portions of two reports obtained by Food Safety News were redacted. The outbreak covered in the reports began in the fall of 2023. Median age of patients in the outbreak that sickened 165 people was seven. That's child abuse. Organic Pastures, aka Raw Farm, a brand of raw milk and other brands of raw milk, 
have been linked to multiple previous outbreaks of, according to the report from the Division of Communicable Disease Control. The agency reported that the salmonella outbreak, which affected 165 patients, is the largest in the past decade associated with raw milk. Tests of raw milk from the raw farm dairy and raw milk in patient homes match the outbreak strain of salmonella. 14% of patients with known information required have hospitalization. Raw farm Seeds production issued a recall on October 24, 2023, but resumed sales on October 31st. Of the patients, with information available, 93% reported consuming Raw Farm LLC raw milk. About raw milk. According to the California Division of Communicable Disease Control, raw milk or unpasteurized milk is not grass-fed or organic labels. It is about pasteurization. Milk that has not been pasteurized has been shown in numerous recalls and outbreaks to be contaminated with one or more pathogens, including E. coli, Salmonella, Listeria, Campylobacter, and Brucella. From 2009 to 2021, unpasteurized raw milk was associated with 143 outbreaks. Pasteurization is considered one of the public health's most effective food safety interventions, according to the California Division of Communicable Disease. Before its use, millions became sick and died from tuberculosis, scarlet fever, typhoid fever, and other diseases. Pasteurization was initially developed for wine in the 1850s and adopted for milk about 20 years later. In the 1920s and 1930s, pasteurization of milk became the norm. Now, the sale of raw milk across state lines is prohibited by federal law. Pasteurization has repeatedly been shown to not decrease milk's beneficial properties. So if you're trying to argue that raw milk is healthier for you, or there's something you're losing in the pasteurization process of milk, is false. There is no reason to consume raw bovine milk. It is too risky. And we know that the pasteurization works because H5N1 parts of it were found in pasteurized milk. So it destroys the virus. Don't drink raw milk. Especially right now with, all, with dozens of uh, cattle farms, uh, dairy farms that are testing positive. See, when a cow gets sick from H5N1, the cow starts turning a yellow viscous liquid instead of cow's milk that we're so used to. The cows seem to re bounce back. I haven't heard of cows in mass dying of the H5N1. They are very robust, hardy animals. But it's not as if they are unaffected. Their cream comes out very wrong. I'll read that one more time for people that consume raw milk for the health benefits. Pasteurization has repeatedly been shown to not decrease milk's beneficial properties. There is no medical reason, no scientific reason, to consume raw milk products, period. Especially right now when we have so many cows testing positive for H5N1 that's giving sick milk. It is alarming that so many people feed their children raw milk, raw bovine milk. Very dangerous. And this should be child abuse. If the child gets sick from the food or beverage 
that is being given to them to eat by a parent, that trust is broken. And that is abuse. Children don't have a choice. It's up to the parent to make the right decisions. And giving your child raw milk, I, there's no reason for it. I don't care. Especially right now with what we know about pasteurization. And especially with H5N1 being in such ludicrous amounts of uh, cows across the country. Cattle to cattle transmission. There has been a fourth person that was tested positive of H5N1 that worked on a dairy farm. We move cows around, they get shuffled around, bought and sold. They get mixed in with other cows while they're traveling. And it spreads. It spreads so quickly that nobody had time to say stop all movements of cows in the country because it's causing the virus to spread. Terrible. You hate to hear it. You hate to hear that people are getting sick from consuming something that is risky. Like raw meat, uh, bear meat, game meat. You read too much about people that are risking way too much by what they eat. And especially feeding your child bear meat, feeding your child raw milk, can be very dangerous. And that's why this should be child abuse. If a child goes to the hospital after consuming raw milk, it's the parent's fault. And it should be dealt with. But what are you going to do? If the parents are already feeding the kids raw milk, they don't have much of a brain. I don't care how offensive that is to people to say that if you're feeding your child raw milk, especially right now, you're dumb. There's way too much going on that we know about. And there is no medicinal properties or medicinal benefits of raw milk over pasteurized milk, period. There's no exception. There is no reason to continue drinking, consuming raw milk. It is not something that you do as a child. You do not consume raw milk. After a certain age, you're weaned off milk. So it's unnatural to still consume raw milk. There's a there's hundred reasons why not to consume raw milk. There's a hundred reasons. But getting people to listen before something bad happens like uh, H5N1 transmission through raw milk or Salmonella, Listeria, E. coli, Campylobacter. These are serious illnesses that can happen as a result of a child consuming raw milk. Child abuse, period. Please, don't consume raw milk. Don't buy raw milk products. Do not consume raw milk. It's, it's very dangerous. You want to wait on till it's safe, go ahead. But people that drink raw milk, I don't think they really care about what's in the news. H5N1 is in dozens of dairy cow uh, birds. We know too much now to ignore it. And instead, we're just going to wait until it hits epidemic levels to possibly pandemic if cows moved around so much. This disease can be traveling so far and somebody could be carrying it without knowing. Very, 
very sad see that people are still consuming raw milk at such a level. This is from the Pepe Times, uh, Taiwan. Explosion in starfish threatens coral reefs near Pratis Islands. So these are uh, chronophorans starfish near the Pratis Islands, which have eaten more than 90% of the coral reefs near Atoll. A research team from the Taiwanese Coral Reef Society last month instructed divers to eliminate 1,840 of the starfish to prevent further damage. Here is the crown of orange right here, one right here, one right here. And they just run over coral eating it, zooming it. The density of the crown of foreign starfish in the southwestern waters off the atoll has reached 1,232.9 per hectare, far more than the normal density of 15 to 30 per hectare, Chang said, calling for authorities to control the outbreak immediately. Also known as demon starfish, crown of foreign starfish are a coral reef killer that feed on almost all species of coral and pose the biggest threat to coral reefs, he said, adding that the starfish have a long life expectantly with a high reproductive rate. As a mature 40 centimeter long crown of starfish could lay 280 million eggs per year, the starfish would consume coral reefs like locusts devastate crops, he said, citing the extensive loss of reefs due to the starfish at Australia's Great Barrier Reef. Cheng, a coral reefs expert who has researched the waters surrounding Taiwan for many years, led a research team to investigate the outbreak along the Natural National Park Service's Marine National Park headquarters from June 9th to 12th. Five divers helped eliminate 1,840 crown of starfish, crown of foreign starfish, of which 1,237 were killed by injections of vinegar and 100 on uh, so 600 Three were removed manually, he said, adding that the restoration of coral reefs in the area would take more than 10 years. April to September is the ideal time for eliminating the starfish around the Dongsha Atoll before the northeastern monsoon arrives in October, he said. The risk of the starfish spreading could decrease as long as they, their density can be reduced by September. Meanwhile, the Ocean Affairs Council yesterday said it would stay in touch with the National Park Service and supply vinegar doses and divers as needed. In 2022, authorities worked with Academia Sinica to address a crown of foreign starfish outbreak around Atu Aba, which tackled with vinegar injections and finally controlled more than a year later, the council said. Very, very threatening. Come from hell.
they have spines or quills? They have spines. So they don't... The crown of foreign starfish is a large starfish that preys upon hard or stony coral polyps. The crown of foreign starfish receives its name from venomous foreign-like spines that cover its upper surface, resembling the biblical crown of thorns. It is one of the largest starfish in the world. I thank you for joining me. I would appreciate it very much if you would go to my Patreon. The description has the link to the Patreon. I have a free membership that will let you know when I go live. Patreon will alert you of that. If that's something you're interested in. I also have a $5 tier what I call headliners. And I would like to thank my headliners right now. I would like to thank Ashley. I would like to thank John. I would like to thank Sean. And I would like to thank Sarah. Thank you so much for your support. It means a lot to me. And if anyone else cares to please at the very minimum click free membership under membership under the patreon.com slash one great earth. What I do is I do this on Twitch and I just starting this now and then I upload the video onto YouTube later. So it's um it's an engine. So we're hopefully able to see positive growth. I'm just starting on Twitch for the first time. So this is all new to me. I've been streaming on YouTube for like the last year. Uh, since October, I've been streaming. Uh, mostly I try to stream daily. But YouTube, what happened with YouTube is um, 10 years ago when I created the account, I didn't know this was going to be a problem. But whenever I set up the account, my account type, I put as an organization instead of individual. Now, YouTube, or YouTube can change that for you. That's what they told me. They can change that. But because my account suspended, they don't want to change it because that would mean that I'd be able to appeal. They don't want me to appeal, so there's nothing more I can do for that account. I have to walk away from 6,500 subscribers on YouTube because uh, it's not getting any better. About my, my ads... Uh, ad support, uh, possibly like if it's like super chats or anything else that's rolled up into that, that's devastating. But right now, we're on Twitch, we're live on Twitch, and we upload the uh, video on YouTube after this. Appreciate your time. I thank you very much for joining me. I'm just starting on Twitch and I'm not sure how well it's going to go. I'm starting from nothing pretty much. Uh, I try to update my YouTube community, but I find YouTube reaching out to people on YouTube can be pretty difficult if they're not watching the video. Like posts and stuff like that can get buried and they don't see it. Or they might not be on their phone. They might be on YouTube.com and 
I don't see posts come up like like uh, images and polls and stuff like that. Okay, this is a big one. This is from the Kathmandu Post. Floods displace 900 families in Kanchampur. Several places, including district headquarters Maham Ranagar, inundated after incessant rainfall. Floods and rivers, including the Mahakali, have displaced 900 families in Kanchanpur district. According to the Kanchanpur district police officer, police office, 3,293 members of 891 households were relocated to safer locations as of Monday morning. Floods have submerged settlements in Dadhera Chandani Municipality, Bimdada Municipality, Bedkop Municipality, Beldandi Rural Municipality, Alori Municipality, and Punarbas Municipality. Dodhar Para Chandina Municipality Mayor Kishore Limbu said the flood inundated Patia Kavar, Shanatol, Nishanatol, Beta Fanta, Sundar Nagar, and Kanj Bosch, among other settlements in the municipality. I hope I got one of those right. Over 300 families have been displaced by the flood, said Limbu. The water level is increasing and the settlements have been completely submerged. More than 100 families in Bimdada municipalities wards 11, 12, and 13 have been displaced after the Bajula River flooded the settlement. The displaced families are taking shelter at ward offices and schools. Police said several areas of Mahan Ranagar, the district's headquarters, have also been flooded, displacing hundreds of families. The areas were flooded due to the lack of proper drainage in the market area. Similarly, various areas of Beldandi have also been flooded after the Chadhar River overflowed into the settlement. Floods in the Doda and Makheli rivers have submerged the riverside settlements. Water level in Mahakali River was high on Monday. According to the police, the measurement taken on Monday morning showed the flow had reached 255,000 Cusacks. The Banbasa Bridge of Shaharda Barrage has been closed to four-wheelers for the third consecutive day on Monday. Movement of large vehicles is prohibited after the water level crosses the 100,000 Cusex mark. The 573 millimeters of rainfall in the last 24 hours, which is the highest, record, highest recorded in the period across the country. That's uh, almost two feet of water. There's almost two feet of water that rained. It's very abnormal. Very terrifying. It's massive. All right. Can I not multi-stream to both YouTube and Twitch? I don't know. I haven't tried. 
I um I know there's a way, but I haven't tried because I'm just starting on Twitch. Uh, thank you, African Sport Africa Sports Drink. I will look into uh, multi streaming to both YouTube and Twitch, but for now I'm just going to upload it onto YouTube after the video. Thank you for the suggestion. Um, I know like restream and other things are a thing, but as of right now I just use OBS and I'm pretty still new to streaming. And I'm definitely very new to Twitch. But I don't, I will try that to uh, multi stream to both YouTube and Twitch because that is definitely probably a step. But the problem with my account is um, the ad is, uh, is suspended. My AdSense account is suspended. Not a big deal, but after seeing that suspension and uh, after much trying to appeal, YouTube declined. But I will, I will look into uh, streaming on both YouTube and Twitch at the same time. Because uh, it, depending on how you, because if I upload the video, it comes up as a video. But if I live stream at the same time, it'll be in the live stream area, which is the top of the profile. So I will definitely look into that. All right. I thank you for joining me here. And uh, I thank you very much, Africa Sport Drink. Great suggestion. I will definitely look into restreaming or uh, streaming on both YouTube. Because right now, um, I just have the video appearing as an instant premiere on YouTube. But that's, uh, that's interesting. I will definitely look into that. Because um, I know there's more... Uh, streaming services and twitch and youtube but if i restream i can probably hit more than just a couple of them so that that might be a slippery slope i can just start getting addicted to it. streaming to all every uh service platform i can <laughs> mm. all right i thank you very much for joining me thank you very much to uh, africa sports drink for your comments for your suggestion i'll definitely look into that Thank you very much. Please take care.